welcome to the first episode in a new series for the Common Sense Skeptic, produced by request of our Patreon patrons who have grown weary of trying to explain to people why certain conspiracy theories are so very obviously wrong. We are labeling this the Tinfoil Hat series because the conspiracy theories that we are going to take on really are only defended by the most outrageous, paranoid, and scientifically illiterate of society, and this really is a fun opportunity for us to take the piss out of them. But that doesn't mean we aren't going to tackle the topic with indisputable facts and try to convert a couple of them in the process either. Today's episode is Debunking Flat Earth. There is a disappointing group of people growing larger every day who seriously believe, despite all scientific evidence to the contrary, fueled by social media channels, that our Earth is flat. These believers call themselves Flat Earthers, but since that's most certainly an oxymoron, we're going to shorten their description for our purposes to something more fitting. We're just going to call them flatheads. The core belief of flatheads is that the world we live on is not a globe at all, but rather shaped more like a pie plate, with the entire Earth's surface distributed in such a way that sea level would extend as a level plane away from all shores, terminating at a defined edge of the world. This terminus, according to the believers, is an impassable wall of ice which they believe is represented on our maps as Antarctica. The fact that spacecraft of all eras of spaceflight have photos of Earth from various orbit elevations doesn't deter their thought process in the slightest, because obviously all the photos and live video NASA shows are fate to keep humanity in the dark as to the true nature of our planet. For the flatheads, give us the next 20 minutes and we'll do what your elementary school teachers obviously failed to do, teach you about shapes, light, common sense, and Occam's razor. Let's start with the basic difference in the shape of the Earth based on photography from space versus the models that the flatheads use. There's a photo NASA is very proud of called Earthrise, taken by the astronauts of Apollo 8, which is considered one of the most iconic images of the century. It shows a partially lit Earth coming up over the horizon of a dusty lunar surface. Comparing the portion of the globe that was lit at the time, it would compare it to the lunar phase called Gibbous. The line between night and day is curved along the surface of the globe, extending from the north to the south poles, approximately. This lighting can be replicated with any sphere lit from an angle by any source. And there's a very simple experiment on the NASA website that shows how to teach this concept to first graders. Now compare that wonderful simplicity against the proposed model of flat Earth. Honestly, first you have to pick a model that you intend to use. Is it the Earth shaped like a frisbee or the hemisphere with the flat top and doesn't have a giant glass dome covering it like a terrarium? For our purposes for this presentation, because only an abject imbecile would believe we are covered by a giant glass dome like the Truman Show, we're going to ditch those concepts and just concentrate on a pie plate or a hemisphere paradigm. For our purposes right now, that really doesn't matter. If you watch this animation illustrating how flatheads believe the sun moves around their two-dimensional map, you can see they believe the sun's energy is directional and focused so as only to affect one portion of the map at any given time. The Sun, which must be far closer to the Earth than the distance we measure it to be, swings in a circular pattern around the North Pole and illuminates only a portion of the surface at any given time. Oddly enough, the Moon in this model from their own website seems to move in opposition to the Sun in a daily pattern, although everyone is aware that the lunar cycle is actually just short of one month. At no point would this model ever result in the ability for the Apollo 8 astronauts to capture the photograph they did. So of course, the flatheads simply insist the photograph must be a hoax. Now taking a look at the poles on our globe, we see the North Pole and the South Pole. These are the surface intersects of the Earth's rotational axis, which we know exists because the Earth rotates around this axis and the angle of that axis is what determines our seasons. Now, if the Earth was stood straight up on its axis, we would not have seasonal daylight variations. Standing on the North Pole, no matter which way you look, you would be looking south. Conversely, at our South Pole, everywhere you point would be towards the North Pole. On flat Earth, this is true of the North Pole, located at the center of the map. However, because these people believe Antarctica is actually a giant ring of ice, that goes around the outer edge of this map holding the oceans in place that would make the entire outer ring technically the South Pole. 
There is no single position from which you can stand on that ring and point in any direction and still be pointing towards the opposite pole. From the position on the outer ring, there is only one way you can point which gives you that desired result. Mind you, you wouldn't be standing perpendicular to the surface at the outer ring of flat earth. You would actually be standing almost parallel to the ground and trying very hard not to tumble towards the center. Why? Because of gravity. The center of gravity for this giant disk would be located below the North Pole at the center of this map, so that is the direction you would be pulled regardless of your position on the disk. The closer to the center you approach, the straighter you would stand, but the opposite would be true heading towards the outer rim. At all times, there would be an imaginary line running from the planet's center through your feet to the top of your head. This exists now, wherever you are. You are being pulled towards the center of the Earth through the soles of your shoes or if you're sitting, through your bottom. And you're not parallel with the floor, you're standing or sitting perpendicular to the floor. On Earth, when looking out to sea, you can observe where the sea meets the sky, and that's a line that we call the horizon. Most people think the horizon is a lot further away than it actually is. To a person standing at the shore, watching a ship disappear over this horizon, they will watch that ship start to disappear from view once it is 3 miles or 4.5 kilometers away. More importantly, if they're watching through binoculars, they will see the ship appear to sink into the sea from the bottom up. And if they climbed a ladder or went to the top of a nearby building for a higher vantage point, they would once again be able to see the ship and watch it disappear a second time. On a flat earth, as the ship sails away, one should technically be able to watch that ship sail across the sea from New York to Gibraltar, getting ever smaller, but never actually disappearing from view. One of the easiest ways to disprove this nonsense is to compare actual distances and travel times that are known to proposed distances between points on the respective maps. One of the problems with flat earth maps is they never seem to provide a scale by which to measure distances, which completely negates the point of having a map, but we should be able to take a known distance and apply it to their map. In this case, we'll use the distance across North America from LA to New York, which is approximately 4,000 kilometers. We will apply that metric to use in the distance calculations, then we'll compare it to what the measured distance actually is. For this, we're going to select three easily identifiable southern points to capture the distances between them on the globe versus the flat Earth. The cities of Sydney, Australia, Ushuaia, Chile, and Cape Town, South Africa sit at the southernmost points of the three continents that extend into the southern hemisphere. These points are the outermost markers of three continents forming a triangle. On the flathead map, starting from Cape Town, it takes five of those 4,000 kilometer lengths to reach Ushuaia, Chile for a depicted distance of over 20,000 kilometers. However, we know from GPS measurements on Google Earth and international flight times that this distance is actually less than 6,800 kilometers, so the measurement between maps is off by a factor of three. That direct flight would fly over open ocean until it encountered the northeast coast of South America, running parallel along that coast from Recife, Brazil, then past Uruguay, Argentina, past the Falkland Islands, and approaching Ushuaia from the northeast. Leaving from Ushuaia for Sydney, Australia, it would take seven of the 4,000 kilometer measuring units to complete the journey for a total of over 28,000 kilometers, except the distance is only 9,500 kilometers. So once again, the map is off by a factor of around three. That point to point direct route would run along the western shore of South America, cut across Central America, fly over the Bering Sea in Alaska, and finally approach Sydney again from the northeast. Completing the circuit, flying from Sydney back to Cape Town, which you can normally do by traveling over a portion of Antarctica, it takes almost six of those measuring units to get back to Cape Town for a depicted distance of about 23,000 kilometers, but it's only an 11,000 kilometer journey, so that's off by a factor of two. This trip, as the crow flies, would apparently take the traveler back over mainland Australia, then over the Philippines, northern India, the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia, and then over mainland African countries including Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique, again approaching the destination from the northeast. 90% of that flathead route will have been over dry land. On Google Earth, the trip would look like this, instead of, more properly, like this, where the flight is more than 90% of the time over open ocean, in reality. 
it would be a safe bet to say that nobody taking that flight directly was ever able to, at any point in time during that trip, look out the window and take an aerial shot of the Himalayas. On this animation, the flatheads depict a flat earth being lit and warmed by a sun that is close enough to the earth to be a focused spotlight rather than an omnidirectional source of energy. For those who believe the spotlight paradigm is possible, we would ask you to try this experiment. Put a lamp with a bare light bulb in the center of an empty room and try to hide in the shadow it casts. In order to create shadows, one must place something else in the room. To light a very specific portion of the room, the bulb must be recessed into a chamber that doesn't allow the light to be seen from the side whatsoever. The structure required to focus a light source capable of producing one kilowatt of energy per every square meter on the Earth's surface would be massive. Since the amount of energy hitting the Earth at any given time is in the neighborhood of 173,000 trillion watts continuously. Now, at first glance, it would seem the flathead model does account for some of the parameters required for a 24-hour cycle of night and day. The light source rotates around the plane once every 24 hours and even keeps the North Pole lit for the majority of the time, as you would expect during a Northern Hemisphere summer. The problem is, it does not account at all for any other season. See, we know for a fact that when the Northern Hemisphere is in winter, the Southern Pole is in summer and lit with constant sunshine. Yet in this model, where Antarctica is represented by the entire outer rim of the map, no matter how you swing that focused light source, it is not possible to keep the entire outer ring lit. One aspect of the flathead argument that is rarely addressed regarding the flat earth model is how thick these people believe their model to be. All fine and dandy for the earth to be flat, but any physical object also requires depth. Even on the obtuse Flat Earth Society page, tfes.org, there is no mention of the thickness of the Earth, most likely because they would have to acknowledge two things. Number one, the thicker the model, the more closely it would resemble a globe. And number two, they would have to acknowledge that there is another side to the disk that they propose. If our entire known planet is on the top face, what's on the bottom? Here's what we know. We have tried digging into the Earth's core many times. The deepest borehole to date is the Kola borehole in Russia. The project was undertaken by a Russian geologist in 1965, and for 30 years the project drilled a 9-inch wide hole as deep as they could go. The project maxed out in 1989 at 40,230 feet, or 12,262 meters, a little short of their initial 15,000 meter goal. The deeper they drilled, the hotter the strata became. Measurements at depth determined the temperature at 12 kilometers was over 180 degrees Celsius, around 356 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the borehole itself could not maintain its integrity, since the material they were drilling through was behaving similarly to warm plastic and filled in any cavity the drill bit created. For three years, the team tried to drop the hole further down, but to no avail. Project was terminated in 1992, the hole was sealed in 1995. For comparison and clarification, as deep as that effort was, it was only a little bit deeper than Challenger Deep, which is the deepest ocean trench located in the Pacific Ocean in the southern end of the Mariana Trench. That measures 11 kilometers down, or about 36,200 feet. Because the temperatures continued to climb throughout the COLA experiment, the deeper they went, it can be safely concluded that the hole did not extend beyond the halfway point of the plate thickness, otherwise the temperatures would have become cooler again. The question would be, how close to the center is it likely to have come? To assist with that answer, we'll call upon one of the greatest natural forces on the planet, volcanoes. Volcanoes are vents in the Earth's crust that release pressure built up under the crust, which carries molten rock called magma to the surface. Magma, once it surfaces, is more properly called lava, structures of which are referred to as igneous rock when it cools. Some of the hottest lava temperatures on record come from the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii at 1500 degrees Celsius compared to the 180 degrees Celsius temperature of the Kola borehole at 12 kilometers. If the scale of temperature versus depth is linear, that would mean for every kilometer of depth, the temperature raises 15 degrees. That means the magma is coming from a depth of about 100 kilometers. And that finding is actually pretty close to what we see on these graphs that at a depth of 100 kilometers, the temperature of the material is in the neighborhood of 
1500 degrees. Now that model is based upon Earth being a spherical globe, which lends further credence to what we know as reality. Once that temperature is exceeded, the viscosity of the geological materials change, and the temperature change per kilometer doubles to 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer until maxing out at around 6700 degrees Celsius at the Earth's core. This tremendous heat is a result of three contributing factors. Heat from the original formation of Earth that is not dispersed, friction as the materials in the mantle continue to settle, and the decay of radioactive elements. If the Earth was a thin plate, heat caused by Earth's creation would have dissipated long ago, and there would not be enough material at depth to cause the type of temperatures we see, in the case of volcanic eruptions, from simple friction. That leaves radioactivity, which would fry everything on the surface if that amount of radiation was coming from within a very thin disk. Any flatheads that are watching, if perhaps you have a better explanation for volcanoes that your website have yet to disseminate, here's your chance to share. We know, for certain, that the other planetary bodies in our solar system, our moon included, are all spherical. We know this by observation in real time. Anybody with a telescope, binoculars, or even a camera can view the moon's surface throughout its phases and determine it is spherical. The same for Mars or Venus or Jupiter. We can observe the planet's rotation, its track across the sky, the predictable orbits and intervals and alignments. We know how far away the moon is because man left experiments on the surface that allow us to measure that distance using lasers. And we've confirmed our landing on the moon by leaving those experiments in place. We know that the sun is further away from us than the moon because of solar eclipses, which means that the smallest the sun is capable of being is the same size of the moon in the same orbit, since the moon covers the sun completely. The further away from the moon, the larger the sun has to be to present that same phenomena. And we know full well because of lunar eclipses that the sun goes behind the earth to project our shadow upon the moon. Those look like this, not like this. We know how far the moon is from the earth. We even have a picture of it to scale provided by the Mars Odyssey spacecraft from 2001. It shows how far away from earth the moon is and how small both spheres are, which presents a real problem for the flatheads. And it takes a very simple diagram to demonstrate how large a device would have to be to interrupt that line of sight. You take a straight line from the top of the earth, you connect it to the bottom of the moon. Then from the top of the moon, draw a line from the bottom of the earth. Let's refer to these as the poles, even though that wouldn't be completely accurate. Now that we see the process, let's compress this to a diagram that's not to scale, but a little easier to view. For a device to block the sunlight completely from someone at the south pole of the earth, it would have to prevent the viewer from seeing any portion of the surface of the sun. And as it moves across the sky, the aperture of the device would cause the sun to disappear, like this. Because of the distance between the objects is 240,000 miles or 386,000 kilometers, and the intersect is at around 180,000 miles or 290,000 kilometers, the sun would have to be recessed into a chamber no smaller than 120,000 miles long or about 193,000 kilometers, simply so that the people at the south pole of Earth could not see any light from the north pole of the moon. If these observers moved towards the equator, they would once again be able to see sunlight. If the device is shorter than this, persons at the southern pole would still be able to see sunlight. More importantly, everybody on Earth, depending on where they're looking from, would be observing the sun or moon as a different shape, ranging from a very thin oval to a full circle at the sun's zenith. One more point, going back to the map animation. We know, without question, that tides in our oceans are brought about by the moon and are a daily occurrence, alternating between high and low tides four times per day. We also know that the lunar cycle is a 30-day cycle. Neither tides nor the phases of the moon are accounted for in their pie plate planetary model. Every morning, we watch as the sun appears from below the horizon, traverse the visible sky, and then again sinks below the horizon. And no matter how high you climb, this is the case. You can watch this happen from a shoreline, or while traveling on a long haul flight, or from orbit. If you like to see a live shot of the sunrise, as happens on the ISS every 90 minutes, you can tune into the NASA Live channel anytime you like. Of course, if you watch that channel at any point in your life, you already know the flatheads are completely out to lunch. We have to assume that most of the people who promote flat Earth are doing it to take advantage of people who seriously don't know any better. The Flat Earth Society, for example, sells merchandise through their website and Amazon based on their premise. 
just their COVID masks right now are running 21 bucks. And the International Flat Earth Society, with members all around the globe, pay up to $399 for a VIP pass to their annual conferences. At least they're using their money wisely. The grand figurehead for this organization, complete with his own episode of National Geographic Explorer sparked by his organization, is Mark Sargent. This former software designer either wholeheartedly believes our globe is a pie plate, and or he's getting rich off the people he can fool into believing this trip. In a scene from that Nat Geo episode, the host visits an experiment being conducted on a lake that allows scientists to demonstrate how a ship disappears over the horizon from the bottom up. Mark Sargent and his flatheads were at this demonstration, and their response? They denied the experiment's validity while watching it, and they blamed the results on optical illusions. This same guy, Mark Sargent, denies man has ever been to space. He says every photo taken from orbit is photoshopped, that every video depicting a round globe is staged, and at least when the cameras are rolling, he keeps swearing by these beliefs like a devout French Davidian. For those people who bought into Sargent's sales pitch, we will once again refer you to Occam's Razor. This is a philosophy that suggests when you are presented with two explanations for an occurrence, the simplest explanation is most likely correct. So which is the simpler explanation for the world we live in? That our planet is shaped like a pie plate sitting under a glass dome with painted on stars where measured distances cannot be portrayed accurately on a map and seasons cannot be modeled where every picture or live video taken from space requires falsification to avoid the masses from knowing the truth, or that our planet is shaped like every other observable object in our solar system that revolves around the sun as they do, whose time zones and seasons are easily modeled based on a tilted rotating sphere, and is, in fact, what our astronauts and satellites have been taking pictures of almost every day for the past seven decades. If that is a tough question for you to answer, we have to wonder where you land on the Binet IQ chart. Are you an idiot aspiring to become an imbecile? Or are you an imbecile who would have to study night and day to become a moron? Because if flat earth is something you truly believe in, those are the only two options available to you. Thanks for tuning in to this tongue-in-cheek episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. We've had some fun with this episode, so many thanks to our patrons for the episode suggestion. And we would like to thank our Patreon supporters for the direct support of this channel. Johar, Stinkpickle4000, Alex Kane, and Clemens Arbiser were the first four people to give this channel their patronage. We're now just a couple of days away from SpaceX's October 2020 update on their Starship napkin drawings, so for those of you who have enjoyed our Starship series, make sure you tune in for that update. Hit the like button, share with your friends, and ring the subscription bell so that you know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.